So probably my most amazing artifact in my whole museum is this little ivory idol that was found by an Arab man in Samaria. He collects ancient artifacts that he finds on the tell and then he sells them to tourists. And one year when I went to Samaria, he had that. And I immediately knew what it was because this is what the Bible says. 1 Kings 22, 39 says, As for the other events of Ahab's reign, including all he did, the palace he built and adorned with ivory, and the cities he fortified, and are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? So this tells us, before you ever we ever excavated Samaria, that when they went there, they would find ivory. Okay? So the archaeologists who excavated Samaria, they were looking for ivory, and they found more ivory in Samaria than they found in any other city in the Middle East. It had to be imported, and Ahab, King Ahab, used this ivory to adorn his palace. Well, one of the artifacts they found was this, and this is called the woman in the window. All right, so the picture next to it right here is what I bought from the little Arab man, and that's also the woman in the window. It, it looks like she's wearing a hat, but it's not a hat. It's the window frame. It's the same, same image, all right? So as soon as I saw that, I knew immediately what it was, and I was not going to leave without buying it. So I, I uh, talked him down to $100 and bought that from him. And it is a Samaritan ivory. It's the image of the woman in the window. Uh, and it's priceless, basically. I don't, you couldn't find another one like that anywhere. So Samaritan ivories are in museums all over the world today because they found so many of them. So, and this is interesting as well. So you can take this picture here and then read 2 Kings 9.30. It says this, When Jehu went to Jezreel, when Jezebel heard about it, she put on eye makeup, arranged her hair, and looked out of a window. So most archaeologists believe that this image that was in King Ahab's palace was an image of his queen, who was Jezebel. So probably that little idol there is the image of Jezebel that was made into that and that's a fertility image and it's a pregnant Jezebel so kind of an interesting idol wow the display is New Testament yeah. and some of the sites in the New Testament are different than the Old Testament because of the Babylonian captivity so you have to figure when they took the people away for basically three generations before they came back when they came back, some of the sites were named different names or built in different places. And so this right here is an artifact display of the crucifixion. Okay. So what's cool about that is when the Bible talks about something, you can actually find the archaeology. Like the Bible says Jesus was nailed to a cross. Well, these are the types of nails they would have used, iron nails to nail criminals to a cross. The Bible says they pierced Jesus Christ's side with a spear. That's a Roman spear tip from the first century. The Bible says they paid Judas 30 pieces of silver. That coin right there actually could be one of the coins, but that's the type of coin they would have paid Judas because the priests of the, of the temple would only accept one coin, which was the Tyrus shekel, the, the, the shekel of Tyre, because it didn't have a Roman god on it. Every other shekel that they used at that time period was a Roman shekel and they all had Roman gods on them and they wouldn't accept those shekels. So we know when they paid Judas 30 pieces of silver, they paid him 30 shekels from Tyre. Okay, just like that one. And that one dates to the right time period. It was discovered in Bethlehem. So it's entirely possible that could be one of those coins. I mean, it's not likely, but it's possible. Okay, so what's really cool in this is that that stone right there it's a part of what the Bible calls Gabbatha. So you, you know what Golgotha is, right? Mm -hmm. Gabbatha is the pavement where oh. Jesus stood when Pilate tried him. When he was tried before Pilate, he was standing on Gabbatha, the pavement. Wow. And that piece of stone is a piece of that pavement that broke off of a corner and was falling down the hill. And I, I could see where it had broken off. And so I brought it home with me. So that piece of stone right there... Jesus actually could have stood on that stone when he was being tried awesome. in 30 AD or 32 AD, whenever he was tried by, before Pilate. 
So yeah, that, those are the kind of things that I just find fascinating. Those are the kind of things that they used to collect as relics in the old <laughs> well, it's world. It's interesting to me because, you know, I mean, I've, I've heard little things, bits and pieces, you know, and I, I collected the coin. I've got uh, not real ones, but I have, you know, right. re replicas. And I collected replicas of uh, the uh, widow's mite. And when we went to Israel with my church, my uh, pastor has this great... Um, um, guy, his name is, um, oh golly, Ave, Ave, yeah, Ave, yeah. Ave, and so it's like everybody says, oh, he's the best, he's the best. And every, everywhere I go, who's your guy? I say, Ave. oh, he's the best. That's the, you know, three words. Oh, he's the best. <laughs> and it's over and over again. So it's just, re and so uh, I got widows, mites, real ones, and you know, of course, um, replicas and stuff. While I was there, and, and I was trying to collect evidence the Bible's true. But obviously, I haven't gone as many times. You don't want to go once. So right. for me, it's just, uh, you know fascinating to see this kind of stuff. I remember um, Avi took us to the um, I think it was the West Steps, the actual steps going up to the original right. mount. So there's some you know replicas that they've you know replaced, but the original ones are right there. You can see the steps and you know and where Jesus would have walked up those steps into the temple. Yeah, so it was yeah. really cool. Yeah. First, we went into the caves and all kinds of stuff. I was I was. We underestimating what it was like to go to Israel. I mean, I just, well, okay, my church is going. I was going to go with yeah. Josh McDowell. It didn't work, so my mom died. I couldn't go. So then going to Israel, the first day I, I come in, and we're going to go see this Roman Coliseum. I'm going, mm -hmm, okay, Roman Coliseum, I'm there, fine, you know. And I look, and there's one original step, perfect. All the rest of them are all imitate, you know, rep replicas. That's fine. We're looking over the sea, and it's at, uh, oh, what is it, um, Where's the place where um, Caesarea? Yeah, Caesarea. It was um, Caesarea. So and so, you know, I think okay, fine. We're looking around. You see all the monuments and all the different uh, columns, and we come through this little gate, and there's a little pedestal there and a little rock on it. And the tour guide says, "This is the uh, Pontius Pilate stone." Yeah. And then he walks off. And go, wait a minute! I read that when I was a kid. Pontius Pilate stole me. They, they thought Pontius Pilate wasn't real, and then all of a sudden they found the stone. And it's like, oh, this is old. Yeah, isn't it? And it says oh. Pontius Pilate written in Latin, so oh. you can read it. Uh oh. <laughs> I think Pontius Pilate was a real person. Yes. He's only like curator for three years. Then they find his coins. So I bought some Pontius Pilate coins too. While right. I was there. He's like, yeah, I'm getting some of those too, you know. And I'm going, honey, come back here. This is a Pontius Pilate. So I asked the tour guide, "That's the one?" No, no, it's in the museum. This is a Replica. Right. So later on, I didn't see it at the museum because I forgot to look. So I want to go back to Israel again because it was just amazing. I was shocked about how I, I estimated it this much, and it was oh, yeah, it mountains. was over the top. Mountains. Over the top. So I said, okay, I'm going back again. Now I don't know who I'm going with because my pastor couldn't go again because everybody couldn't go again for right. COVID. So I want to go again. So it sounds just... I, I want to I want to go to a different group next time so I can do more archaeology, do more of the... Uh, you know, a little different history. So well, this, different look at this it. site right here has been positively identified now. It was always guesswork in the past, but now they found the Bema seat. They found the gate where the gate was, where Jesus was taken into the Praetorium and out of the Praetorium and into the Praetorium and out of the Praetorium. Really? Yeah. And they, they're now, they're, they've started just during, during COVID excavating inside the wall there and they found some of the pavement that would have been the pavement of the Praetorium. Wow. And they haven't found the whipping stone yet, but they'll find it. And when they find the whipping stone, they'll know exactly where Jesus was scourged. Wow. So yeah. it's going to be really interesting. Yeah. I can't wait to go back again. It's just, it's, just, it's just amazing. And collecting coins. And then the Sea of Galilee, that was another surprise for me. Uh, you know, we ate at Peter's Restaurant, right? right. St. Peter's <laughs> Restaurant. So we ate there. And they said, well, if you get done early, just go down by the beach, you know, and, Walking beach work. So I'm walking on the beach and I'm hearing this crunch, crunch, crunch noise. I'm going, what the heck? I've been on the beach before. You look down, it's not sand. Right. It's little seashells, little littler than my fingernail. I'm going, well, no wonder they call it the Sea of Galilee. It's got seashells. Yeah. And they're, 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 they're freshwater seashells, but it's seashells. So yeah. no wonder it's a sea. I mean, it's just a lake. You know, come on, yeah. guys. You know, like, like, lake Erie is a lot smaller. Yeah, you it's know? not even that impressive yeah, to yeah, us. But like, it's, yeah, bro, that's the yeah. seashells because it's got seashells. Okay, got it, you know? <laughs> See of Galilee. Yeah. So yeah, so I, I got a I got two baggies of seashells to bring home to give to people. Just say, hey, seashells. That's why it's called the Sea of Galilee. Galilee. Right there, seashells. See that? It's yeah. like, oh really? Yeah. I get to keep these. Oh yeah. And I buy um, Did you go to Caesarea? I mean to Capernaum on the sea? 
to Peter's house to no, the, the White Synagogue. Mm-hmm. You didn't go there. Oh, yeah. because if you if when you if you ever do if you go with me yeah. if you get to Caesarea or not to Caesarea to Capernaum, mm-hmm. go down to the seashore and you can pick up pottery there because really? pottery, there's pottery laying along the seashore. Oh wow! So sounds like fun. Can't wait. I didn't get any pottery. Yep. So, yeah, and I didn't get any uh, stones, you know, Goliath stones. <laughs> yeah, Goliath stones. Yeah, I've got a bunch of them. <laughs> I know. You saw me some of them before. I never got any of those. Over here, so look at these. Take a look at so stones. these are, these two sling stones right here, I've got, so there's a sling stone up there, there's sling stones here, there's sling stone down here, there's sling stones over here. So these are, they're all about the same size, the size of a tennis ball to the size of a baseball. These two sling stones were found within 100 yards of where David and Goliath would have fought their battle. Wow. So I like to tell people, maybe, maybe. <laughs> I mean, there's no way to prove it, but they're, they're in the vicinity. It's a maybe, though. And those, are definitely, maybe, those are definitely sling stones, yeah. so possible. Yep. Wow. So, yeah, I can't wait to go again. It sounds like a lot of fun. I, I, I'll enjoy it. Uh, yeah, at the time. So, and that, yeah, have you seen that before? That's a brick from the walls of Jericho that came tumbling down. No way. Uh-huh. That is a real brick from the walls of Jericho that came tumbling down, yeah, or a amazing. piece of a brick. Yeah, that's just amazing. Yeah, and you found that in the tell, huh? I found that in Jericho. Yeah, yeah. I can't you can sure. only find them if the so the the walls of the trenches that the archaeologists have dug, if the wall erodes enough that it collapses then the bricks are exposed and then they're only exposed for a short period of time maybe a year or two and then they melt so oh. because they're made out of sun baked bricks okay. so the only way you can find a brick like that is if you happen to be there one of the years when a piece of the wall collapses and then those bricks are exposed for a short period of time until they melt wow and so yeah so that was i was there one year and joel joel pointed it out to me he said see those down there those are the bricks of Jericho that collapsed. That that, that wall has, has fallen in. And if you want to collect one of those, you can collect one of those. So I went and collected no it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I want to collect one of those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How many people in the whole world have, yeah, have a, a, wall, a piece yeah. of the brick it, of the wall? Like every time I give away a, 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 a widow's mite, uh, everybody, I mean, I've had women to almost cry. Oh, yeah. For, uh, it's just a, it's a replica of it. It's just like, oh, this is so... It's so valuable. It's so cool. You know, these these are widows. These are widows' mites here. Widows mites. And there's a lot of similar ones. And there's they, a lot of and small people coins. call them widows mites, and it's like okay. You yeah. Know, especially in Jerusalem. And it, everything. And honestly, the, <laughs> the, the 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 widows mite. A good one. It is, isn't it? And that's a coin of John, or Jonathan. Yeah. Jonathan. Right. And on that coin, it's a star. Yeah. In between the spokes of the star are the letters Jonathan. And that one? Uh huh. I'll be darned. And I don't know if you can see it on yours. I don't think so. No, they don't have the letters in it. Whoops. But the Hebrew letters are in there, and it's it's Jonathan's Messiah coin. He was really? claiming to be the Messiah. Really? Because he was the king. He was a he was a prop. He was a priest of Israel, mm-hmm. and he was ruling Israel at a time. One of the few times when Israel was in, was sovereignly being ruled, and he claimed to be the Messiah, and so see the handle there with with the stars on it. Those are those are Jonathan star handles. Hmm. He was stamping those with the Messiah symbol, this, which is the the star. So remember the the prophecy of Balaam, that a star will rise out of Jacob, mm-hmm. a scepter will. Yeah. That that prophecy has been has been um, cherished throughout the centuries by the Jews back. that the Messiah would be a star. And stars represented gods in the ancient world. So a star, a god who would hold the scepter forever in Israel, is a god king. And that's what Jonathan was claiming to be a god king. This coin right here is mm-hmm. King Herod's Messiah coin. King Herod was claiming to be the Messiah. Oh, wow. back on top of that helmet is a star. Oh, so no. he's claiming, I'm the Messiah, I'm your king, and uh, the people didn't accept him. But they did accept they. Jonathan, but then he died and oops, went, <laughs> went away. And, oops, yeah. yeah. It works again. Get and then this, this, coin, coin. this coin right here, this coin right here is a Bar Kokhba coin. So the Bar Kokhba revolt was in 130 AD, so they're still looking for their Messiah because Bar Kokhba means the son of the star. 
Oh, wow. <laughs> so you got another one over here. Is this a real one? Yeah, this is a half shekel. So it's that's half as much silver as that one. Oh, really? And a half shekel is what every Jewish male was required to pay for their temple tax yearly. It oh, was wow. a half shekel. And two males could go together and, and buy, use a whole coin, or you could just give them one coin. Wow. So that's a full shekel, and this is a half shekel. Yep. And mm. they're both they're both the same. You can see the, the person. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a Tyros shekel. And this one I, I got through an antiquities dealer who had it mislabeled. Really? He called it a, he called it a dinar. Oh. And it was in a piece of jewelry, and he was selling it for $120. And... I said, is it real? He's like, oh, yeah, it's real. I was, was excavated in Bethlehem. I'm like, okay. So I bought it. And then I immediately took it to an, to a, a, an antiquities, well, it looked like a coin shop. He said, I need to know if this coin's real or not. And he took one look at it. Goes, oh, yeah, it's totally real. That coin is worth, I'm not going to tell you on top of camera, <laughs> but... He had uh, thousands of pot handles made or pots made with his signet seal on it. And so each seal was created specifically for the different cities of Israel. Mm -hmm. So there was like belonging to the king for Lachish, belonging to the king for Hebron, belonging to the king for Zoko. And this is a Zoko seal. So that's King Hezekiah's seal. It was a pot that he created to put in the walled city of Zoko so that they could collect taxes in it. And then when the Assyrians came in, he hoped they would have enough supplies in their fortified cities to hold off the Assyrians, but it didn't work. And so almost all of these seals that we find are all on broken handles because the Assyrians crushed everything. So very few pots still have the complete handles and stuff like that. In Israel? Yeah. Did you go to the Tells? Oh, I didn't go to Tells. Oh, well, you got to go out onto the tells. You got to go out onto the ancient ruins. Yeah. And then there's pottery everywhere. Really? Oh, wow. Yeah. You don't always find like a nice complete handle. Yeah. But you find broken handles all the time. Oh. You don't always find a nice complete like jar rim or something. That's those are rare. Next time you go, let me know. I'd like to go with you if you don't mind. Mm. You're going to go again? We're going to go in the spring again. <laughs> the problem is we have so many people that are saying exactly what you're saying yeah. to us. So uh, the first people that are going to get the option to go are going to be people that got canceled in 2020 when COVID stopped us. Mm -hmm. So this is our display that we use to show LDS people that the Bible could not have been corrupted, at least after the time of Christ, which ties perfectly with 1 Nephi chapter 13. Because in the Book of Mormon, in 1 Nephi chapter 13, it describes that a great and abominable church arose after the Lord's apostles had died and they removed, they, they took away from the Bible the plain and precious truths of the gospel of the Lamb. So you can, you can go to the Book of Mormon, read 1 Nephi 13, and it describes that a corruption happened to our Bible, a corruption happened to the gospel of Jesus Christ after the apostles died. Okay, so that would have been in about 100 AD. So the apostles lived... Between this period, right in this period right here, from the time of the crucifixion until 100 A.D., John, the Apostle John, we believe, probably died at about 96 A.D. Um, that was close to the end of his life. And so an event happened in 70 A.D. when a vast majority of the apostles were still alive. Okay, so in 70 A.D., there was a siege of Jerusalem, actually a siege of Judea. There was a revolt. The Romans brought the 10th, the 10th Roman legion into Judea. They squelched the rebellion and they leveled all of Judea. They destroyed Jerusalem. They burned the temple. They destroyed everything. And just a few years before 70 AD, they had gone down through the Jordan Valley. And when they came to the Qumran community, they utterly destroyed it. But before the Romans got there, the people in Qumran took their scrolls, which were the, the, the Old Testament scrolls, and they hid them in caves on the mountainside around their community, and they sealed the caves. So you have to understand, this area is the hottest place on earth, the driest place on earth. It's the perfect place to preserve manuscripts. 
And the Jews put the manuscripts in jars with lids in caves that they sealed. And those manuscripts then remained hidden from human knowledge until 1947 when the first scrolls were discovered. So when they finally did discover the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947, they found scrolls in 13 different caves. And in those 13 different caves, there were 220 different manuscripts that were biblical manuscripts. So multiple copies of Deuteronomy, multiple copies of Isaiah, multiple copies of other texts. And only a few were complete texts, but of the, 100, of the 220 biblical manuscripts they found, the majority of the Old Testament is represented in those, in those fragments of manuscripts. So as you're looking at these manuscripts, they date to the time of the apostles, and they weren't found until 1947. So it's very easy for us to determine whether any corruption happened to the Old Testament text by simply comparing these 220 biblical manuscripts with the text we have today. And it can be absolutely stated without any qualms whatsoever that no commandments, no doctrines, no principles taught in the Bible were altered in any way. So the, the Old Testament text remains intact and we can't you can't touch that all right with the old testament we have the hebrew that was written between 440 bc and 400 bc so we've got hebrew texts but then we also have the new the old testament translated into greek so we've got greek septuagint texts that were translated long before the time of christ in about 285 bc but then also right before the time of christ we have the old testament being translated into aramaic and these are the Aramaic Targums. And so these texts here, when, if you're, if you're going to try to change the Old Testament text, you've got to also change all the translations. And if you're going to try to change the New Testament text, after 200 AD, you've got to change all the translations as well. So if you're, if you're thinking about how many Greek manuscripts we have, we have 6,000. But if you're thinking how many ancient texts we have, we have about 30,000. And none of those texts demonstrate any corruption, like intentional corruption of the text. So it just, it's impossible. Our text could not have been corrupted. The New Testament, at 70 AD, the same thing happened, except in a different way. The persecution against the, the Jews started then. It's called the, the diaspora. But, it, but the persecution against the Christians, the intense persecution started at the same time period. So in 70 AD, when, the, when Rome destroyed Jerusalem, the Christians fled. And when they fled, we know they took the letters of the apostles with them. And the way we know that is because they scattered into the far reaches of the Roman Empire. So this map up here will show you where the Christians fled. So Christians that were in Judea, when the Romans came in, it's, it's interesting when you read the wars of Josephus. So Josephus was the historian who recorded the destruction of Jerusalem when he describes the Romans destroying Jerusalem. He says there were no Christians in Jerusalem. It was all Jews that were killed by the Romans. Why were the Christians gone? Well, it's because Jesus had prophesied. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, flee for your lives. And they did. So the Christians that were in Judea, some of them fled north into ancient Armenia Others fled south into North Africa. They took the letters of the apostles with them. If they were north of the Mediterranean in Italy or Greece, they fled north away from the persecution into Europe. So we know they took the manuscripts with them because the, in North Africa, by 150 AD, the New Testament was being translated into Coptic which is the language of North Africa. By 150 AD, the, um, the manuscripts were being translated into Latin that went north into Europe. So this is, this is a Latin manuscript. And by 170 AD, we know that the New Testament was being translated into Syriac in ancient Armenia. So we, we know the manuscripts were there. So they were scattered very early in Christian history. And then today we collect or we we take photos of we find the manuscripts <clears throat> so 
Presently today, we have very close to around 6,000 ancient hand-copied Greek manuscripts from all over the Roman Empire, and actually as far away as like monasteries in Mongolia, we find manuscripts uh, of the New Testament. So these manuscripts are, are housed in museums, in colleges, in private collections, all over the world, all right? And though they've been photographed, we have approximately 6,000 of them, many of them very early. So look at this over here real quickly and see this. These are some of the earliest New Testament manuscripts. So the Rylands papyri is the one that is, is touted as the earliest, which is 125 AD. This is a replica of that. This is the Bottomer papyri. It's an almost complete book of the book of John from the second century. And these are the Chester Beatty Library, and they contain almost all of the, the uh, epistles of the Apostle Paul in the second century. So we have a large volume of manuscripts that date into the second century, which is only about 100 years after the apostles lived. And we can compare these ancient Greek manuscripts with what our manuscripts today say. And just like the Old Testament, no, no doctrines, no principles, no commandments that were present in the New Testament have been altered in any way, shape, or form. So because of the sheer volume of manuscripts that we have, both Old and New Testament, we can say absolutely positively that no corruption happened to the biblical text. And that's the importance of knowing the history of the Bible.